Hey, good morning, everyone there in Bethel, Bad West. Um, I'm really sorry I'm not with you this morning, um, but uh, I'm, I'm week two into a brand new uh, church plant in Sarn in South Wales. My name is Rodri. I'm a good friend of Ewan's. I know that would have met a few of you before, so I'm really looking forward to sharing God's word with you today. But apologies, I'm not with you. I am literally, like I said, week two of a brand new church plant. I'm probably putting a pie in someone's face or something silly and ridiculous like that um, in our family service that we are having. Let me come to share God's word with us this morning and in a moment we're going to read from the Bible but I just want to start first of all by taking a moment to marvel at humanity. By human hands, some amazing things have been done. The, the pyramids were built in Egypt, the Sistine Chapel was painted. Humans have so much capacity for good, providing care and aid for people or nations in need. And there's such magnificence in what we are able to do, from the voice of the best opera singer to the riffs of a shredding guitar solo. Yet, in humanity, we have this greatness blurred with a wretchedness. Some humans abuse other humans. Humans wage war on each other. Humans can often use their sharp and learned minds to cause destruction in other people's lives. So let's be honest this morning and reel with ourselves and ask ourselves the question, and excuse me for being so flippant, but why are humans so dysfunctional? Why do we have this tension in our lives of being able to do such good, but also such evil? as well? Why do relationships fall apart? Why do we fight? Why, when we look on the comments pages on social media, they're just so awful to read through? Why do families break up? And in this day and age, why on earth is racism still a thing? How do we make account for this awful state that we find ourselves in? We can do such good but such evil as well. Well, this morning we're going to read from God's word and God's word just gives us an account of why this is the case. We're going to jump into Genesis chapter three. We're going to come to the point after Adam and Eve have just sinned. They have eaten the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. They've disobeyed God. And we're going to see a picture where sin spoils everything, including human to human relationships. And we get a description of the reality of this fallen world that we now live in. So let me read to us this morning. If you've got a Bible there, we're in Genesis chapter three, nice easy book to find in the Bible, the first book. And I'm going to start reading from verse eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. 
It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food, until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Let me pray for us now. Dear Lord Jesus, we have just read from your word this sad account of the curse and the fall and the banishment from the Garden of Eden. We see so much falling apart, we see sin spoiling everything and in that passage there is sadness and there are some, maybe some phrases and words that we're a bit uncomfortable with this morning. Would you please help us? We trust you. We trust that your word is perfect, that your all scripture is breathed out by you and is profitable for teaching. So I just pray for us now. Would you please help us not just to learn from what we have read this morning, but also that we would grow and that you would transform our lives as we just take in what you'd have us to hear from you today. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. As we spend time in this passage this morning, I want us to get a grasp on two things in particular. Firstly, I want us to see the reality of human relationships in this fallen world. And as we get our heads around what it's like, that's going to help us have healthier and happier relationships as we just temper our expectations of what human beings are going to be like to us. The second thing that we're going to get our heads around is that the good news about what Jesus has done for us at the cross, this revolutionary gospel that we have come to believe in, we're going to see how that reverses the judgments and the curses that we just see happening in the Garden of Eden. And seeing that redemption story can give us hope for the future and hope in the present as well. But first of all, let's get our heads around What has happened in this sad passage? Now, there's three principal things that I want us to highlight from the verses we've read. Three relationships that have broken down. The first one is that the relationship between humans and God has been disrupted here. At the start of the passage, picking up in sort of verses eight and nine, we can see that because of sin, because Adam and Eve disobeyed God, things are starting to unravel. God calls out to them as he is expecting to see them in the in the cool of the day. Where are you? And yet Adam and Eve are hiding. They're ashamed of what they've done. They're ashamed of their nakedness and they're hiding from God. By the time we read through to verse 23, the big thing has happened. Very clearly, God pronounces the banishment from the garden. They are no longer going to have the same relationship with God that they were enjoying in the previous chapter, in chapter two. Now, of course, we know that God goes on to interact and speak with humanity and with humans, but that relationship was nothing like it was before sin spoiled everything. The second relationship that we see disrupted and broken because of sin is the relationship between humans and this planet. In verses 17 to 19, we've got all the cursed is the ground, farming's going to be a bit hard uh, stuff pronounced to Adam there. And in short, what God says to him is that you're going to have to wrestle with this planet in order to get the food that you need to eat and survive. 
it's going to be hard work. There's going to be thorns and thistles and weeds. It's going to be hard to get the food that you need. And in this day and age, this, this reality, this sad reality is all the more obvious for us. With all of our efforts towards green energy and carbon zero, it's just so obvious to us at the moment that human beings struggle to live in harmony with this planet that we live on without spoiling it. It's a struggle. It's a wrestle. It's hard. But the third relationship that has broken down and the one that I want us to focus on this morning is the human to human relationship. It's disrupted. It's broken because of sin. Sin has spoiled humans to human relationships. Now, as we unpack this this morning, it's really important that we understand that what we read here isn't God saying this is how things should be. Instead, what we're going to be reading here is is a description. It's a description of the fallen world that we live in. It's a description of spoiled relationships because of sin. Sin has spoiled everything. And in fact, what we read here in Genesis chapter 3 is meant to be in contrast to Genesis chapter 2, where everything was good. Everything was very good. Everything was perfect. Come to chapter 3, sin has come in and everything is spoiled. This is meant to be a contrast with how things were designed and meant to be. And we see in Genesis chapter two. Okay, so we see the things start to break down between humans to humans, particularly in verse 16, as God addresses Eve. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you'll give birth to children. In other words, it is going to be hard work. And for those of you who've been on a labour ward, you'll know that it's even dangerous, painful, life-threatening to bring more human beings into the world. It's going to be hard, a struggle to survive and propagate the next generation of human beings. That's what sin has spoiled in the first place. But we read on in verse 16. God says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Even within a marriage, people are going to experience trouble and anguish because sin has spoiled everything. This relationship, which is meant to be the closest, most intimate, most beautiful of human relationships, even this has been spoiled by sin. There in verse 16, it's talking about a sad reality. There's going to be tension in marriages, but also we get this foul stench of male dominance. And sadly, we still see so much of that in this day and age. And I'm sure many of us have experienced the sadness and pain and hurt that is called, caused by male dominance. And we just see that this has creeped in and come in because of sin. This is the reality of human relationships now. Not by design, not by God's good design as it was in Genesis chapter 2, but by sin and sin spoiling everything. This is now what it looks like. And if that's the description for marriage in a fallen world, supposedly the closest and sweetest of human relationships, you can see the problem that we have across all of humanity. From the closest of relationships with a marriage to work colleagues and friendships and all the spectrum in between. Human to human relationships have been spoiled, warped and ruined by sin. Shall I move on to some of the more positive stuff now? But it's helpful to have this real description and give an account for 
how this horrible tension between we can do so much good, but actually we can do so much evil as well. Actually, that's a real description in Genesis 3. Because sin has spoiled everything, this is the mess that we find ourselves in. And I'm a firm believer in that that phrase forewarned is forearmed. I believe that God in his grace has given us passages in the Bible like this to help us as bleak and upsetting as they are to read at first. They can really help us. Why does this particular passage help us? Well, one way is that it helps us to better understand the reality of our relationships. And as we better understand just what this is like now, that really helps us to change our expectations in each other. Is This is going to help us have healthier and happier relationships. Have you ever watched a rom romantic comedy film? I'm not a huge fan of them, but I've watched enough of them to know that quite often they follow a bit of a formula. The lovers fall in love. It seems all happy and rosy, but then there comes the low point in the film. One of the lovers does something to the other one that upsets them. Oh, they've given them white roses instead of red roses. Or they've brought them a cuddly toy of a stuffed squirrel when actually it's rabbits that they really love or something stupid like that. They've said the wrong thing. They've done the wrong thing. They've touched a nerve. What does the offended person almost always say in a romantic comedy? They say something like, I thought you knew me, but you don't know me at all. Now, forgive me for being unromantic and a bit scathing of romantic comedies, but should that lover really expect that level of knowledge, sensitivity and insight from this person that they've just fallen in love with? They have this expectation that, oh, now that we're caught and I expect the other person to know the deepest recesses of my heart. I expect them to be aware of all of my past experiences of joy and hurt. I expect them to know all of my subtle psychological triggers and insecurities, the stuff that I've not even verbalised to myself or out loud to anyone else. It's kind of forgot this expectation that because we've fallen in love, they must have multiple degrees in psychology and just fully understand the deep recesses of my heart. That sounds a bit far-fetched to me, but do you know what that is? And actually, it's obvious in a romantic comedy, but this is something that we all do in our lives from time to time. What is going on there is that you have a human being expecting another human being to know things about them that actually only God can truly know about us. The deep recesses of our heart. Even the most cleverest psychologist with multiple degrees is never going to know truly deeply what's going on inside us. But our Father in heaven does. So why would we expect another human being, perhaps someone, oh, I've just been caught in for a little while, or even people in our lives, people we've known for a bit of time already. I think I would say that actually this is a bit of an unfair expectation to have in another human being. I would say that this is actually a recipe for unhealthy relationships and for fights. If we expect another human to being, to know things about us that only God can know about us, then that human being will always let us down. That human being will always upset us. Not because of anything they've done wrong, necessarily, sometimes, yes, but not necessarily. But if we've got the expectation that they're going to know stuff that only God knows about us, then actually we're being quite unfair in having that expectation on them. In fact, so often we hang a burden around people's necks, even our friends, even our loved ones and our family members, by having these sorts of expectations. And ultimately, this is a foolish idol of the heart that says, I want to receive from a human being what I can only receive from God. 
by default, and especially if we view ourselves with trashy romantic comedies, we will think this way and we will have these expectations from our human relationships. But as we come to passages like this, and this is why the sad, bleak Genesis chapter 3 that we are reading today is God helping us and giving us open eyes in his grace he is helping us here. From passages like this, we can come to the conclusion that there is a good design for human relationships. We see it wonderfully in Genesis chapter 2, but it's been spoiled by sin in Genesis 3. And we still live in that time now. We still live in Genesis chapter 3 times now, where human relationships have been spoiled by sin. Because we know that, we are forewarned and we should be forearmed to change our expectations of what human relationships are going to be like. Let's stop being people who expect humans to know things that only God can know about us. Who really knows our hearts? Who really can satisfy our deepest longings and soothe our deepest insecurities? God. God alone can do that. That kind of stuff is impossible for human beings. Stop expecting it from human beings. Come to God alone. He does know our hearts. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So let's come to him and him alone to meet the deep, right, the deep needs and the recesses of our hearts. As we shift our gaze and expectation away from people and towards God now, verse 15 gives us a glimmer of hope. Verse 15, as God is pronouncing the curse on the snake, this agent of evil, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God has got a plan. And amazingly for us living this side of the cross, we know the details of that plan. But here in this verse 15, we get a, a glimmer of it on the horizon. A crushing blow is going to be dealt to this agent of sin and evil. And this side of the cross, we know that Jesus indeed dealt that decisive crushing blow. Christus Victor, our victorious saviour, defeated Satan, sin and death once and for all. On the cross. And the promises of the New Testament, which are the promises for us as well, Jesus is going to return. He's going to make all things new. All that we now see broken is going to be restored. What were some of the things that were broken as a result of the fall, the things that we've seen in Genesis 3? It's life to death, it's freedom to shame. It's all things pure and good, Genesis 2 to sin in Genesis 3. It's fellowship with God, walking with him in the coolness of the day to being banished from the garden. But what are some of the results of the redemption that Jesus has made possible through this revolutionary gospel that we have come to believe in? It's death to life, shame to freedom. Sin to righteousness and banishment to fellowship with the living God. As upsetting as the world around us can be, as upsetting as the broken relationships that there are between human beings, and perhaps we are running with that hurt right now in our own lives, Christians don't despair. We have a hope in Jesus Christ. He will reverse all that was broken in the fall. Let me read a few words from Romans chapter 8 just to see how wonderful a hope we can have. 
Paul says in Romans 8, we know that the whole creation has been grown in as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. I love the honesty in those those words from Paul. In effect, he says, this sucks. This broken world that we live in, this is something worth groaning about. It's broken. It's ruined. Ugh. But as Christians, as people who have their hope in Jesus Christ, we can wait patiently for what we know is coming. And even more than that, those verses say we have the first fruits of what is to come when Jesus makes all things new. We've got the first fruits, the foretaste of that now. And that is made possible by the Holy Spirit who dwells and lives in each one of us who believe and trust in Jesus. And it's on that point that I'd love to just wrap things up this morning. The Holy Spirit gives us the first fruits, a taste of what is to come. The Holy Spirit makes things possible, which would otherwise be impossible. He heals people. But as we apply this to human relationships, we'll find that when we are satisfied in God alone, when we are filled with his Holy Spirit, filled and overflowing, we stop needing and expecting humans to plug the gaps that only God can fill. Oh man, we've got capacity to do so much good to help and support one another, but Really, in the deep recesses of our heart, there are gaps that only God can fill. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we stop chasing the wrong places for that. We stop trying to expect that from our human relationships and we come to God alone. And as people who are filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit, that makes us full and free to give out to others, to love with the self-giving, self-sacrificing love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, to love and care for others like we have been loved and cared for by our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who has laid down his life for his sheep, for us. We're free, we're full to love and give out to others. And you know the thing is, we have a terrific opportunity as the church, as God's people. We've got an opportunity to be opportunity to be a bright, shining lamppost of all the good that is to come when Jesus returns. Of all the places in the world, it should be in the church that we see this bright, shining light. It should be in the church that we see the most harmonious and loving relationships. Why? Because the church is where God dwells. The church is where God meets with his people. The church is where God meets the needs of his people. The church is the gathering of people who believe and trust in Jesus and this redemption story that's going to see everything made new, every relationship restored, every hurt taken away, every tear bottled up. That is what is ahead of us and we can shine with the first fruits of that in the church, in our relationships. We are filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit and so we can love and care and pour ourselves out for other people. So would you come to him now? I'm going to be handing back to uh, to whoever's leading your service this morning and why don't you together 
come to God. Engage your hearts with God now. And just think, what are the needs that you have this morning? Personally, in your own life, personally and more widely within your church relationships and your church family. What is it that you need? Perhaps we need to repent of chasing these, the, chasing for other people to be meeting these needs. Let's this morning come to God. Perhaps a sense of belonging. Perhaps to feel and know that you're unconditionally loved. Perhaps that sense of security. Perhaps you need calm during a storm in life. Don't chase that in human beings. Come to God. God alone can meet the needs and the deep recesses of our hearts. So I'm going to hand back to you guys and just engage your hearts with God, whether it's through prayer or reflecting on a song. Just come to God and find that he meets every single need we have. Open up your hearts to receive the Holy Spirit so that you are full and overflowing. It's been wonderful to share God's word with you this morning. I pray that that would bless you and that God would be with you through the rest of your service together now. Take care.